My kids, this is truly a tribute to motherhood, isn't it? Boy, it's wonderful. All right, today's Mother's Day, isn't it? And wait, did y'all give your moms a hug this morning? Did you give your grandmas a hug this morning? Did you give your grandma a hug? You didn't? She needs your hugs, yeah. You do that when you get back home, okay? She hurts. She hurts, okay. <laughs> Don't hug her then. Just throw her a kiss. Can you do that? <laughs> Uh, I don't know how. Boy, do we need to teach him how to throw a kiss? You need to go. Can you do that? No? Okay. All right. This is a day of remembering mothers. And, of course, one of the most important mothers in the Bible was Mary. Mary. Yeah, the mother of Jesus. And she was precious, wasn't she? Yes. And so this morning I have to remember my mother, too. Now, my mother has gone to heaven and she's probably looking down at me and thinking, oh, Mary, what are you doing now, you know? <laughs> but anyway, I brought a few things that helped me remember her. And as I'm doing this, then you guys think about the things that your mama does and that you will remember in the future. And one thing, my mother loved to sew. And so she made my brother pajamas. This is an old, old pattern. And she loved to sew, and she made all our clothes, you know, which we didn't have Walmart in those days to go buy clothes, you know. So anyway, you want to hold that for me? And the other thing she used to do is, um, you know, when we had a sock that had a hole in it, we didn't throw it away. Do you throw yours away when you get holes? Yeah. Yeah? All right. Well, in my day, you didn't. And see this little tool right here? See that little tool? Well... Let me show you. Stick it in the sock. Here's a needle and thread. And see that little hole there? Well, she would darn that little hole up so I had a pair of socks I didn't have to throw away. So isn't that a nifty little thing? No one ever does that anymore now, do they? It looks like one of the cheapest. It does look like a maraca, doesn't it? Dean thought it was a thing that you crushed your pills up, you know. But doctor would know that. <laughs> yeah. Anyway... That was one of my memories of her, sitting there darning my socks, okay? The other thing was that she loved to cook. And this is an interesting little thing that her great-great-grandmother sent from Germany. This is 180 years old. And these make cookies. They're called springulas. And you make the dough, and you press this down. And see all those pretty little shapes on there? And then you let it set on the cabinet overnight. Then the next morning, you take your knife and cut them into little squares and bake them. And those were the little cookies. So that was kind of special memory of my mama. And then, of course, my mother was an immaculate cleaner, so we had to have dishwashing soap. We didn't have dishwashers in those days. We all had to wash our own dishes and dry them and put them away. And then probably the most important thing, memory of my mama, was her Bible. And here's her Bible. Here's her name right on the front. And so she read daily out of her Bible, <clears throat> which was a wonderful memory for me. So I want you guys to think about all the things your mama does special, just little bitty things like donning the sock, you know. Your mamas have special things too. And your grandmas, you've got grandmas that do that right too. All right. So cherish those in your heart. You know, and uh, just like Jesus, Jesus cherished his mama. Even on the cross, he looked down there and made sure somebody was going to take care of her after he died and went to heaven. So that's pretty special, isn't it? In all his misery, he was thinking of his mother. So, all right, <clears throat> let's have our prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful today that we can come here, have fellowship, have fun and remember our mamas. And we just think they are such special, special people. And that we were so happy that we have good memories of them. Please guide us and direct us this coming week. And uh, just pray for all the blessings. In my name we pray. Amen. All right. Now, hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. Yeah, you can pass out the treats. But the Armstrong kids have some flowers to pass out, right? All right. So get your flowers. And uh, go give them to every lady in the room, okay? And then you can come back and get your treat, okay? You might want to get your treat now, okay? Because they're going to they're gonna have these flowers to hand out. And get your treat. <laughs>
For our opening song, we are blessed to have a beautiful Mother's Day song in our hymnal. And it's sort of become a tradition for us to open our Mother's Day uh, service with this song. It has a couple of stanzas and then the chorus. I will read the stanzas and then if you would sing the chorus with me, please. All right, here we go. Her strength and her dignity clothe her with beauty. In works of her hands, she excels. A heart of compassion, she turns to the needy. In service to others, she gives of herself. Very good. Very, very heartwarming song there, Linda. Good message there, Marietta. And uh, what a nice little gift from the Armstrong kids, huh? Well, this morning for a word on giving, I'm going to go back to some fundamentals, I guess you might say, that Paul taught to the people in Corinth, to the church there, about giving and the instruction behind it. Uh, it, it's really just a simple passage, but there's a lot of importance to it because it outlines some fundamental principles in how we approach giving. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2, Paul says, On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. So there's some principles outlined here in the simple passage in verse 2 that shows us that all the way back in the ancient church, they gathered on Sundays like we do, and he says, and he gives the instruction that we each must set aside something. And I, and I often explain that when we talk about giving, that it's not always about putting money in an offering plate, because he says something. To, to each of us, we've been given and blessed with different resources, right? Whether it be time, talent, finances, resources, whatever we've been given stewardship over by God. And those are the some things that each week we should set aside as a, as a means to help God's church, as a means to help what the church can do with those resources to help others outside the church. It's an instruction that's fundamental. Jesus says we're, we're instructed to give. 
And he says, you're more blessed when you give than when you receive. And Paul says, there's a frequency to it. On the first day of every week, set aside something, each of you, so that the kingdom can grow, so that needs can be met. And guess what? We're the ones that this instruction comes to. It is ours, this responsibility, to be stewards of this divine instruction. We are the hands and feet God has placed here in our communities, in our families, in our workplaces, that we are to put aside something that we can offer to those in need. So, maybe, maybe it needs to be... Um, more powerful than, than the supposition that we give based on a feeling or, 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 a, or a leading of the Spirit. But maybe Paul's giving us some more instruction that you do this each week, regardless, so that there's a habit formed and a principle established that needs can be met because we're the hands and feet that God's created to do it, Right? I'll leave you with that. Let it, let it soak. Find out what that something is each week that you can set aside for a need that needs to be met. Let's pray. Oh, gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for this instruction from Paul. Help us to be clear about this in our understanding that each week we would have the discipline and the obedience to find what that something is that you've given us that we can provide it as a resource for a need that needs to be met. Father, you, you have given each of us very unique and special gifts and blessings, and you've called us to be stewards of those things. And so, Father, we ask for you to guide us and direct us. But, Father, we also, we also want to submit to an obedience that we would listen to this instruction and apply it. Father, that you would be glorified in it. Lord, we praise you for it. We ask for your blessing upon this giving and this offering and on the hearts that freely give because we have so much trust in you and we've been so blessed by you. To you be the glory forever and ever. In Christ's name we pray, amen. In the Bible, there are so many scriptures that tell us how important it is that our children are raised in a Christian home. And I especially like the story of Paul and his relation to Timothy. Timothy was just a young man, and you wonder, why did he pick him for such an important job? Well, one of the scriptures that tell us the answer is 2 Timothy 3.15. Paul said to Timothy, from infancy, you have known the Holy Scripture. When Timothy was just a little tiny boy, his mother and his grandmother instilled the Scriptures in him. And you see where it led him to one of Jesus' main followers. And that's what this song is all about, the importance of a Christian home. Let's sing. Yeah.
I'd like to welcome you to our part of our service where we take the Lord's Supper. And I know coming from a different denomination more than 10 years ago, uh, I was a little bit bothered by the fact that we took communion every Sunday uh, because where I came from, we did not do that. And uh, Pastor Dan was here at the time, and, and he asked me, do you have any questions or anything whenever we started talking about membership? And, and I said, yeah, this, this deal with communion every, every Sunday. I said, I know that you came from the same background as me. And I said, what, what do you think about that? And he said that it's really, a, to him it became a real blessing that he had the same thing and that we try really hard not to make it just some process that we go through every Sunday, uh, more ritualistic or anything, that we really stop and slow down and think about what we're doing here. So uh, if you're here this morning and uh, you're not a member of this church, we invite you to share in this with us and assure you that it is not ritualistic. It is something that we take seriously as part of our worship. I've got a Billy Graham quote here this morning. I know you guys missed it last week. <laughs> uh, he says, blood is mentioned 460 times in the Bible. 14 times in the New Testament, Jesus spoke of his own blood. Why? Because by the shedding of his blood, he accomplished the possibility of our salvation. Now, I didn't go through this, uh, this week and count the actual 460 times, but I did check, and it starts in Genesis, and it does go through and ends in Revelation, as I would have expected. Now, pertinent to this time in our service, I chose the following passage in chapter 26 of Matthew, Starting in verse 26, it says, While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink of it, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time in our service where we can just stop and recognize the sacrifice that was given so that we might have salvation and everlasting life in heaven with you. And Father, as we think about those who are unable to actually be here this morning in, in body and presence, Lord, we just ask that you be with them during this time, if they're participating along with us. Lord, I just ask that you bless them as well. Father, as we take this, this bread and this cup, let us always be mindful of what it, what it represents and the sacrifice that was given. Forgive us for the times that we fail you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may take your elements.
Thank you, Arnie. Appreciate that. That word. <clears throat> All right. You know, I, uh, I've had this convicting thought about our communion and where it is in our service. And I don't know, maybe it's because of how difficult it is for me to sometimes come up here and, and preach a message after that time of meditation, sitting around the table with the Lord and, you know, just what it all means and how powerful it is, just like Dan said, just like you said, that uh, maybe, maybe this would be, maybe to share that time at the end of our service would be the last thing that we would think of as we walk out the door because I think that really matches the timing of the Last Supper and the, and the fellowship of the disciples around his table before he went and did the work of salvation for us all. And I think that it says right there on our table, in remembrance of me, I would be, I would be, uh, I'd be completely remiss if I were to hope that you would remember something that came from the mouth of Matt rather than the meditation of your heart with the Lord Jesus at, at the table of communion. So maybe we, maybe we flip this around a little bit. I don't know. It's been on my heart, so maybe we'll meditate together, right? Because I tell you, oh, that's all I can do from, that's all I can do just to stand here and be composed after what it means to sit around his table and take the elements and remember what he did for us. Ah, it's only by his power that I'm able to find some grain of composure here. Well, I want to welcome everybody that is watching at home, everyone that joined us in communion and has been with us all morning and continues to be with us each week. And we, we so love you all and thank you for being with us. For those that aren't able to be with us, you are in our prayers and in our thoughts and on the meditation of our heart for restoration and healing. And uh, just want to just want to ask you to sit back and relax and share with us as we dive into verse 8 and 9 of 1 Peter chapter 1. Now last week we talked about verses 5, 6, and 7, and we talked about the, the power of God guarding us in this walk and in this day. And we talked about the fact that he's not only guarding us and protecting us each and every day, but he's also guarding the inheritance that is kept for us in heaven. One for the other and the other for the one. In complete sync. Perfectly sovereign and under control by God. We talked about trials. The challenge in trials. Arnie shared with me one of his trials. I shared with you all last week one of the trials that's going on in our life. We're all burdened with a trial of some sort right? And we recall that Peter said these are temporary, they're necessary, because it shows you the genuineness of your faith. And he said that it is so much more precious than gold when you realize where you stand. God already knows the trial is for you. It's for you to know where you stand. And we talked about the genuineness of our faith in those things. And so today, we move forward just two little steps, verse 8 and 9. As Peter says this, in verse 8, he says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not now see him, you believe in him, and you rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible, inexpressible, and filled with glory, Obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That's something I want you to, to hold fast to today. That's something I want you to really soak in. The power of this and what it means. You know, these, these verses, they really get to the heart 
of all of us, of, of a man-made perspective that says something that Matt said this morning. I'll believe it when I see it. I said, Matt, you just walked right into my sermon. <laughs> and not long after that, Arnie said something, then he'll be walking into the sermon later. <laughs> and in fact, I said those very words. I'll, I'll believe it when I see it because I was responding to something Bella told me this last week about a grade she made on a math test. It's like, Dad, I made an A. And I responded with, I'll believe it when I see it, sis. There's something about seeing that requires or that allows us to believe, right? In the flesh, in this temporal thing, in this world we live in that is so confounded with the senses that we feel like we have to see it, touch it, hear it, to believe it. It's one of those challenges we have. And, and, and we as human beings, we're so attached to the physical part of this thing called life. We discern the outcomes based on what we see, what we can measure, what the Excel spreadsheet says is how this is going to work. It only makes sense that way, right? And so we let those things guide us and we let those things enslave our thoughts and our hopes and our dreams because of the intangibility of what it means to walk on water, right? Right? We discern the things through the flesh, and it's such a challenge. And in doing that, we often miss some of the most important things in life that are discerned through the spiritual element and through our faith. The things that we don't see, the things that we can't always touch, we miss out because we're so temporal sometimes. So, so it really begs a question. It, it really challenges to think. And I'm going to throw this at you and see if maybe I can get your gears turning. Let me ask you this. If, if there were only two things, there were only two things, if you had to eliminate everything else except for these two things from your most important relationships, what would they be? What would those things be? Just two. There were two things that you had to hold fast to. In the most important relationships in your life, what would they be? Well, today, Peter's going to answer that question. He's going to guide us through that. And we've got to get to know Peter, so we've, we've got to understand who, who he is you know, these words from verses 8 and 9 come from the mouth of probably one of the three most important disciples in, in, in the circle of the twelve. Peter, John, and James. Peter being one of those, those three critical that we see there. He, Peter was a fisherman. By trade, we, we know that. And he was called personally by Jesus to follow him. And in the gospel accounts, we see that immediately Peter dropped the nets and walked away from his livelihood and followed Jesus. It's all recorded. And we know that Peter walked alongside Jesus Christ for those three years of his ministry. 36 months or so of walking beside God in the flesh. He met Jesus face to face. Peter actually saw the wrinkles and the lines, the color of his eyes, the color of his hair, his skin tone, his hands, the way he walked. Peter sat with him with meals and ate with him. Peter watched him sleep in the boat as they were crossing Galilee. It was a very close and intimate relationship. And Peter was there and he witnessed it first, firsthand. He, he heard his voice 
and he could recognize who was speaking because he knew him that well. Very close. And maybe most importantly, Peter felt the grip of Jesus in his hand. Peter was a student. He was a student of Jesus. And in those days, they, they didn't necessarily have school like, like you do now, Bella. It's a little different back in those days. The, uh, the students were called what? Disciples, right? And their teachers were called rabbis. You get an A+. Plus. And the student would be taught by the teacher daily through instruction and mentoring, close one-on-one -on -one teaching. And this type of relationship and mentoring lasted for several years. So it was very close, very close bond that they had. And they, and they, and they did just about everything together. It was that close. And so being so close to Jesus for that time... Peter was a firsthand witness to everything that Jesus did during his, mem his, his ministry from about A.D. 29 through A.D. 33. Those years when Christ was fulfilling the ministry that he was given. Peter was right there. He was, he was a witness to it. Peter actually heard the Sermon on the Mount. He sat on that hillside and listened as Jesus spoke. He, he saw the miracles. He saw the things that no one could explain because it was miraculous. His own mother-in-law was healed by Jesus from a fever. He was there. He saw these things. He witnessed them. It was Peter and John and James that were the three that were led up to the mountain by Christ and they witnessed the transfiguration of Jesus. Those three in that close inner circle they were there. It was, it was Peter and, and John and James also that, that went with Jesus when he grieved in the garden or before he was taken away. There's a special relationship there with Peter and our Savior. And so we have to understand the perspective that he had. It was Peter who, who felt... The hand, as I said earlier, of Jesus Christ. Pull him from the crashing waves in the Sea of Galilee on a dark and stormy night. In a moment when Peter's faith began to fear and began to doubt. And it led to him slipping beneath the waves. Peter's given us a reflection of himself here. And not only that, but Peter saw it in other disciples. He saw that, that fear and doubt move in them as well. It was Peter that was standing there when he saw Thomas. And this is where you come into the story. <laughs> he watched as Thomas said in John chapter 20, verse 25, unless I see his hands... Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark that that nail formed and place my hand into his side, I will never believe, Thomas said. So full of doubt in the physical, in the temporal, even though they'd been with him all that time. And then Peter watched eight days later as we move down that, that section of Scripture to verse 27, and we see what happens eight days later, that tells us Jesus was in fact there and heard the words of Thomas and saw the doubt because he's with us all the time. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He knows your thoughts. I discern you from afar. Here's proof of that. Jesus Jesus walks into a room where the door is locked, the passage says. 
This is show the awesome power of who he is. And he came and stood before the disciples, and he said to Thomas, he said, put your finger here and see my hands. And put, your, and put out your hand and place it in my side. And he said these powerful words to Thomas. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, and I'm sure he hit the ground. He says, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, have you believed? And here's where we enter this passage. Do you believe because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen yet have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen yet believe. Fast forward from that moment, 80, 29 to 33. Some 31 years later, to where we are today in this passage. And these words of Christ are echoed by Peter to these people in persecution that had been dispersed and during trials. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not now see him, you believe in him. That's pretty powerful coming from Peter. And he adds to it, he says, and you rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory because it indeed is obtaining, is moving you to the outcome of your faith, the very salvation of your souls. This is so powerful because of who it comes from. Because if you know Peter, you know he was a, a vacillating personality, right? Hot and cold, hot and cold. Committed, not committed. In it to win it, not in it to win it. All over the place. Peter had experienced all the failures of a doubting faith. All the failures of broken trust. And Peter received the harshest rebuke of all the disciples from Jesus. It was Peter who received these words from Christ when Jesus said, Get behind me, Satan. Remember that? What a rebuke. What a sting. Poor Peter. <laughs> it was Peter and the disciples who, who Jesus said, Oh, ye of little faith. Oh, ye of little faith. And it was Peter who Jesus asked, Do you love me? Not only once, but do you love me? Not only twice, but Jesus said a third time, Peter, do you love me? Poor Peter. So you have to understand the perspective of where this letter comes from. It comes from the heart of a person much like us, wouldn't you say? Sometimes doubting, sometimes not fully trusting, sometimes not seeing the picture clearly or discerning it through our senses. So from all of those experiences, all of that time, face to face with Jesus, looking into his eyes, hearing his voice, feeling his grip. Peter's telling us, all of us who have been fast-forwarded 1,989 years into the future from when those words were spoken. He's saying, you, you all, you're much farther along than I was. I saw him, and I couldn't sustain my love. I saw him, and I couldn't sustain my faith. I witnessed him. I walked with him, and yet I still crumbled under fear and doubt. You know, Peter, in, in all of his humility, is reflecting back to the old doubting and untrusting 
person that Jesus would say, Simon. Remember that? Every time Peter fell short of being everything he was created to be, he was called Simon. But when he was Petra, the rock, he was called Peter. Jesus gave him that name. And so Peter is sharing with us a lesson from his past. When we think about 30 years ago, what did your faith look like? How much has it grown through the trials in life? And how much has your relationship with Christ grown because you've seen him work and do the things and, and fulfill the promises that he said he would? I think we're all like Peter in that sense. Here's 30 years later that he's sharing with these people. He's sharing with us. He reflects back on the old doubting and untrusting Simon, and he compares himself to these persecuted Christians and to even us. And he says, you who have not seen Jesus are blessed. Echoing the words of Christ. You rejoice with a joy from heaven that is inexpressible and filled with joy, he says. He says, your faith is being tested and being found genuine. He says, you have a sacrificial agape love for him. Even though you've never seen him. He's, he's sharing his love with them. He's he says, you have trusted and believed in him even though you have never felt his hand pull you out of the water like I did on that stormy night in the Sea of Galilee when I was standing on water with my eyes set on the Savior and then I started to doubt. As I went below the waves, his hand pulled me up. How could I have ever doubted he said, but you, he says, you all, you believe in him, even though you've never seen him, even though you've never felt his hand. You've never even placed your hand in his side, and yet you believe. You are truly blessed, just as Christ said. God's been guarding you all along, protecting you, protecting your inheritance. You are enduring the various trials, and your faith is genuine, more precious than gold. And it all points to this precious gift called salvation. Obtaining the outcome of that belief and that trust and that love. Your salvation. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. You know, I think when we look at what he's telling us here, these two these two verses show us the essence of one of the, the most important elements of your relationship with Jesus. He's given us two very critical elements here. First of all, that you truly love Jesus and he is your first priority. That is the greatest, important, most important thing. And then second, that you truly believe and that you truly trust him. This is what he's telling those people. You haven't seen him, but you love him. You haven't seen him, but you trust him and you believe in him. It, it's, it, it harkens back to the thing that Jesus said in Matthew, chapter 22, verse 37 and 38. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind. And he punctuates it with this. This is the great and first commandment. This is your priority. You have to love Jesus first and foremost with all that you are. And he sees it in these people that haven't even seen Jesus. You know, I truly, I truly love Jesus, y'all. I know you guys do too. I love him 
more and more each day. I read about him every day. I pray with him every day. He talks to me. I mean, he's in my dreams. <laughs> he's in everything. And the more that he's in everything, the more I know him, and the more I know him, the more I understand him, and the more I understand what he wants for me. And the more that I see that, the more I love him, the more I understand the sacrifice. And I think we're all that way, aren't we? And he's taught me the principle here. That we love him even though we haven't seen him and that we believe in him and that we trust him completely. Remember what he said to Thomas. Thomas, even though he walked with him and saw these amazing things and, and was there, he, he said, Thomas, do not disbelieve, but believe. And that's so true for you and me. Loved ones, I would, I would just ask you to apply these principles to your life. That you first and foremost make Jesus the very first thought, the very first priority in your love. That your love for him supersedes everything. That he is first and then that second, that you would just simply trust him. Trust him with your life. Trust him with your job. Trust him with everything that you are about. Knowing that he has complete sovereign control. And that he wants the best for you. That he wants to use you where you are and what you're doing. Even though you can't figure it out. And you can't sometimes see the end of it why this illness came, why the job loss, why the confusion, why the trial. Remember, it has a perfecting work, polishing and refining us so that there are no impurities. And I'll tell you this, if you'll make that the priority in your life, loving Christ first and completely trusting him, that principle of modeling in that relationship in your other relationships will form the bedrock to build a relationship on. You youngsters here. Loving Christ first, trusting him, and let that spill over into your other relationships. Think about these moms today and those relationships they have with their children, their grandchildren. You, you represent the priority of your love with Christ in these other relationships. That love serves as an ambassador to the love you have with your children, your husband, your loved ones, because you model it first and you establish it first in Christ. And it flows out from there. So, I would just share with you these things. You remember what Paul said to the Corinthians. Love never fails. It indeed never fails. It accomplishes the work that it's set out to do. I'm not talking about the same love that, that you use for that hamburger. No. That box of chocolate. No. I'm talking about agape love. The kind of love that says, I'll die for you. I'll do whatever I got to do. That's the kind of love. The love that Jesus showed you on the cross. The Father in heaven. Perfect love. You make that the priority in your life, and you watch what happens when you establish that first. Your commitment to him and your trust in him. Peter says, I was there, guys, 30 years ago. Let me tell you, when I was out on that Sea of Galilee and that storm came, I started to doubt. None of it made sense. And he saved me, he restored me, and he established his church on me. Wow. What a powerful thing. You make him the priority and see what happens. 
So I'll leave you with that today. I know, two weeks in a row, getting out before noon. What's going on with this guy? I'll tell you. I want to proclaim his excellencies so that they are heard. So loved ones today, the message is about your love for him first and your trust in him completely. Coming from a man that had been there and done it the other way, to all of us who still doubt, yes, we do, but grow in it. Be stronger today than you were yesterday. That's what I tell my kids. It's not about being perfect. Nobody's perfect, but we can improve. Right, coach? <laughs> All right. Let's close there today. Let's pray. Oh, gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for these words from Peter. Thank you for the example you've given us in him to, to see ourselves in him. For the confidence that he stirs up in all of us when he says, even though you haven't seen him, you believe him. Even though you weren't there like I was, you, you trust him. And, and here's what Jesus said. He says, you are blessed because you believe in me even though you haven't seen me. Well, thank you for that confidence, Lord. May it move and stir in our hearts. Maybe may it establish a steadfastness in our faith to make the priority of our love in Christ first. That we trust him with everything that we have, everything that we are, with our lives, with all that we experience, Lord, that we, we set our priority on Christ and know and trust and believe that he will carry us through these trials. Guide us to the good works that he's created for us knowing that we are his workmanship, created for those works. So Father, may, may love and trust, may love and, and belief in our Savior be the bedrock that we stand on when the storms of life bring doubt. We praise you for it, Lord. Move by the power of your Spirit in us to give us the discernment and the authority and the power and the conviction to move with these truths. Oh, Father, that you would be glorified. Lord, we praise you for it. We thank you. We ask for your blessing on all those that are sick, all those that are dealing with difficulties and trials and burdens and turmoil. Lord, we pray that you would bring peace to those circumstances, that you would bring, just establish yourself in them, that there would be restoration whether it be relationships, finances, health, Lord, whatever the circumstance, you know it all too well. And Father, we trust you in it. We love you and we praise you. Please forgive us for those times when we doubt, when we waver, when our faith is weakened by the storms and the trials. Lord, please forgive us and shine your light into us and establish us in those places where we're weak, that we would give you all the praise. We come before you and offer ourselves as empty vessels to be filled by you, to do your service, to do your work, that you would be glorified in heaven forever. We praise you and we thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Our hymn of invitation and dedication goes, takes the step one step farther about that sincere love. Uh, the, the author was um, Henry Ware, but I thought it was kind of interesting that the noted po American poet Ralph Waldo Emerson helped him write this song. And he says, Christians may have serious debates over how we should relate to the world around us, but let's all agree, agree on this one thing. The home should be the place bathed in love for Christ. Let's teach our children early that Jesus loves them. Let them lisp his fame from an early age. As this hymn did it indicates, when parents exhibit a genuine love for the Lord, children will see and they will learn. They will still have to make their own choices, but at least they will have lived in a home where God was the important part of the family. That memory will stay with them for the rest of their lives. Let's stand as we sing, Happy is the home where God is there.
pretty fitting. Unite our love unto thee, and all of our love and our one another will reign. Yeah. I think that was the essence of the message. That's right. The foundation is your love with him. That's the most powerful thing. If there was nothing else to hold on to, love and trust and belief in Christ, those are the, those are the fundamental elements of an ongoing relationship. And those are the principles that you can build new relationships on. Right? All you youngsters out there with your sweet, sweeties. Uh-huh. Remember this, guys. It'll go a long ways. And also remember the thing my grandfather told me. Three words that can solve any discussion, any problem. And they go like this. I was wrong. <laughs> so that'll, that'll extend your marriage for years. <laughs> All right, well, let's close with that prayer that we pray. Go out and apply these principles to our lives, to our relationships, to this world around us that needs love and belief, right? Teach them these truths, these principles, because it's good for every relationship. But first, it has to be established with Christ. Let's pray. Our Father who art in heaven, didn't leave this service today and at least thank God for the rain that we had this week. So let's leave the church with there shall be showers of blessing. <laughs>